Well, good evening to you, Victory Through Faith Church. I speak blessings on you in the name of Jesus Christ. I also want to say hello and good evening to our guests who watch us online. You might not be a member of our local body, but you are a member of the body of Christ. I speak blessings over you as well. I appreciate you all taking time out of your day to fellowship around the word with me. I believe we've got a good word for you today. And so I want you to get your Bible, get your pen, get your pad, get whatever you need to take notes and write down the scriptures. So after we have this midweek message, you can go back and see what the Spirit of God revealed to your heart. And you can dive into it on a personal level for yourself and, re and receive even more wisdom and revelation knowledge. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you for another opportunity to teach your word with accuracy and with simplicity. I thank you, Lord God, that as your word goes forth, it ministers to the hearts of your people. I declare that they receive wisdom and understanding concerning their particular situations, Lord God. And I pray that the Holy Spirit causes them to receive insight and wisdom around your word and from your word, Lord. I surrender and I yield myself to you and I give you the praise, the glory and the honor in advance for what will occur as your word is preached and as faith arises in our hearts to latch on to your word and make it our number one priority in Jesus name. Amen. Well, praise God. Let's get into this evening's midweek message. Uh, we're going to begin with part three of our series entitled From Start to Finish. From Start to Finish. And our scripture text or proof text is Revelations chapter one. I'll read those for you real quick. Revelations chapter one, verse eight, and also Hebrews chapter 12, verse two. I'll be reading from the King James Version again. And it says in Revelation 1, 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, this is what it says. I read verse 1 and 2 last week. Uh, today, this evening, I'm only going to read verse 2 for you. In verse 2 of Hebrews 12, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we know that the word God, Jesus, is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And we know that according to Hebrews 12, 2, we should look unto Jesus because he is the author and the finisher of our faith. I shared with you in the first session or the first uh, broadcast around this topic that the more we look to Jesus, the more complete and comprehensive our faith becomes. The more we look to Jesus, the more complete and the more comprehensive our faith becomes, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So let me give you a few points of review from the last couple of weeks, and then I want to talk to you about a specific topic today in alignment or in agreement in the same wheelhouse from start to finish. It's still the heading from start to finish, but I want to share a particular theme with you this evening. We learned over the last couple of weeks that Jesus is the alpha and author as well as the omega and finisher. Everything begins and ends with Jesus. Again, everything begins and ends with Jesus. Glory to God. John 1 tells us that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then later on, it tells us that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus is the embodiment. 
He is the manifestation. He is the culmination of the word. Amen. So Jesus is the alpha and the author, as well as the omega and the originator of everything. Glory to God. Everything begins and ends with Jesus. We learn that the bridge between starting and finishing is choosing to continue. The bridge between my start and my finish is my continual choice to continue, to, to not give up, to not quit, to not give in, but to continue regardless of how difficult it gets, regardless of how hard it seems, regardless of what comes against me. I start with the word and in order to finish with what the word promised me I would have, I must choose to continue. We learn that consistency is the key to the breakthrough. Consistency, continuing to do the same thing, continuing to stick with the course of action. Consistency is the key to the breakthrough. And we read John chapter eight, I read verses 31 and 32 for you. It says, then said Jesus to those Jews, which believed on him. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Consistency is the key to the breakthrough. If you continue in the word, the truth will make you free. If you continue in the word, we're identified as Jesus disciples and we will know the truth and the knowledge of the truth and the consistency to operate in that truth is what makes us free. Consistency is the key to the breakthrough. And we learn that the longer that we stay with the word, the better equipped we become. We read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17 for that. You can write that down in your notes and go and read that in your own time. The longer we stay with the word, the better equipped we become. Now, I want to talk to you this evening about something that I really want to implore you to take to heart because it's going to help you to recognize and overcome what is coming against you. Amen. And so the topic that I want to teach from tonight is this. Don't let Satan win. Don't do not let Satan win. We're talking about from start to finish. So we can we can deduce that when we talk about letting him win, letting him win is allowing him to cause us to quit. We start but we don't finish. And the reason we don't finish, there are several different reasons why, but whatever that reason is, if we desire a thing, but we give up, we give in and we quit, then Satan has won. Whatever we desire that it is that is in alignment and agreement with God's word, we can expect to receive it because his word says so. However, Satan is going to fight you. Satan is not going to allow you to just cakewalk into the promises of God. He's going to come against you and you have to commit up front from the very start that I will not let Satan win. Glory to God. The only way the devil can defeat you is by pressuring you to abandon the word. The only way Satan can defeat you is by pressuring you to abandon the word because the scripture says that we have already overcome the world by faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Our faith. First John five, four greater is he that is in us than he that that is in the world. Amen. You're more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. So you've already got the victory. What Satan does is tries to keep you from experiencing the manifestation of that victory in the area you need it in. Amen. And so he wins when he pressures you to abandon the word. Let's look at Colossians chapter one, Colossians chapter one. I'm going to give you some scripture text to bear this out because I really believe it's going to help you to uh, pursue and then to continue in those things that you desire for God to bring to manifestation in your life. Or actually those things that you desire for your faith to bring it to manifestation because God has already settled in heaven what he desires for you to have and enjoy. It is our responsibility to add faith to what he has settled in heaven and his word is forever settled in heaven. It is our responsibility to add faith to what he has settled in heaven. So what he has settled in heaven can be established on earth. Amen. And it is our responsibility not to allow Satan to pressure us into abandoning 
the word. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23 says, And you know, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable. Check this out in his sight. So in the sight of God, you are holy in the sight of God. You are unblameable. And in the sight of God, you are unreprovable. Glory to God. If that's conditional verse 23, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of of the gospel. So we have to continue in the faith grounded and settled. And what Satan will do is try his level best to cause you to abandon the word. You cannot abandon your faith in God's word because it tells us we are already holy, unblameable and unreproachable in his sight. If we continue in the faith grounded and settled. So we, if we stick with the word, faith comes by what? Hearing the word. So if we stick with the word, if we meditate on the word, if we confess the word, if we pattern our life according to the word, if we continue in it, we'll be grounded and settled in it. And Satan won't be able to tempt us to abandon the word when times get tough, what does it mean to abandon? Do not abandon your faith in God's word. Abandon means to give up completely, to give up completely, whether it is a course of action, whether it is a particular practice you're engaged in, or whether it's a way of thinking. Satan wants you to abandon. He wants you to completely give up your faith walk because the Bible tells us that the just shall live by faith. And so Satan will pressure you in an attempt to get you to abandon your faith in God's word. He wants you to discard your trust, to discontinue your trust, to relinquish your trust, to relinquish your faith in God's word. Listen to this. Mm. Every challenge Satan brings your way. Oh, I got to bear this out. Turn to Mark chapter four. Every challenge that Satan brings your way is intended to make you doubt the word of God. Woo. I'll say it again. Mark chapter four. I want you to go there. Every challenge by challenge. I mean, test, trial, trouble, tribulation, test, trial, trouble, triple tribulation, Temptation, whatever, all the T's, test, trial, trouble, temptation, tribulation, every challenge that Satan brings your way is intended to make you doubt or discard the word of God. Man, that's so that's so important. That's major. You got to get that's so much in that statement. Listen to it. I got to say it again. Every challenge, every test. Every trial, every temptation, every trouble, whatever the case may be, every tribulation, every single one of them are designed. Satan brings your way and they are designed and intended to make you doubt and discard the word of God. I bear that out for you in Mark's gospel, chapter four, Mark's gospel, chapter four. Now, listen to this. It Jesus begins by. Uh, giving the disciples a parable. Uh, I'm not going to go all the way at the beginning of the parable, but if you look at verse three of Mark four, he talks about a sower going out to sow. And then he talks about the different type of soils that the seed hits or the different type of soil that the seed comes into contact with. And so in verse 14, where we will pick up, Jesus is explaining the parable to his disciples in verse 14, he says, Mark chapter four, verse 14, Jesus says, the sower soweth the word. Listen to this very carefully because there's a lot of truth. There's a lot of revelation hiding between these scriptures. Verse 15, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, so we know they heard, when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately 
and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Verse 16. And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard, so they heard also when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves. And so endure, but for a time afterward or afterward when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Now check this out because I want to pause right here. Time out for a moment. The Bible tells us that Jesus is telling us that when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, affliction and persecution did not arise because you were so wrong or you did something so bad or God was punishing you for something you did or did not do. The Bible tells us that when you are continually hearing the word, affliction and persecution will arise for the word's sake. Affliction and persecution will arise because Satan is using affliction and Satan is using persecution to separate you and strip you of and pressure you into abandoning the word that you heard because we see Every type of soil, which represents the heart of man, every heart type heard the word. So it's not about hearing. It's about what you do after you've heard. The Bible says, look, 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 the stony ground. When they have heard, they immediately receive it with gladness. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I got that. It's mine. I got it now. Praise God. That was an awesome word, Pastor. But then verse 17. But they have no root in themselves, and so they endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction and persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Offended because I should have received it by now. I should not have to go through this. Seems like every time I stand on the word, all Hades breaks loose. Well, that's how Satan designed it. When you stand on the word, Satan is going to come immediately to take away the word that is sown in your heart. And if you meditate on that word and you stick with that word for any length of time, Satan is then going to come and try to separate you and cause you to abandon that word by hitting you with affliction or persecution. Glory to God, man, you got to catch that. Now, let's go further. Look at verse 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. So they heard the word too. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. So what's happening here? Satan is hitting the believer with persecution. He is hitting the believer with affliction. He is causing the believer to get distracted by the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things. And in turn, they abandon the word that they heard. Trouble comes on account of the word, not because you're so bad and you're so evil. Because remember, Colossians said we are holy, un unreproachable in his sight unblameable, unreproachable in his sight. So God's not punishing us because he loves us. The blood of Jesus covers us. Trouble, persecution, affliction are coming because Satan is using those as tools to separate us from the word we heard because he knows if we stick with the word that we heard, God watches over his word to perform it in our lives. So Trump, understand this first and foremost. Trouble comes on account of the word, but it's not God testing you. It's not God trying you. The Bible says God can't be tempted with evil. Neither does he tempt any man. So it's not God tempting you with bad situations to see if you'll hold on to the word. It's the enemy using persecution, using affliction, using tests, trials, troubles, tribulation, temptation to separate you from God's word so you can abandon your faith and not experience the finish of what you started out for. Wow. He wants you to rob you of the finish of your faith. He doesn't want you to cross the finish line of your faith. Satan stirs trouble up 
to separate believers from the truth of God's word. Don't let him win. He stirs trouble. He stirs persecution. He stirs affliction. He stirs up the cares of this world. He stirs up the deceitfulness of riches. He stirs up the lust of other things in your own heart so that you can abandon the word because it tells us the cares of this world, verse 19, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things, they enter into our hearts and they choke the word. They rob the word of the sustenance and the life and the nourishment it needed to grow and develop in our hearts. So when we focus on the wrong thing, the word in our hearts suffers. Mm. Satan stirred. I say that again. When we focus on the wrong thing, the word that's planted in our heart suffers because it doesn't get the nutrients. It doesn't get the nourishment. It doesn't get the attention that it warrants in order to grow and manifest within us so, so that we can reach the finish line of our faith. Satan's main goal is to disconnect you from the power of the word. Oh yeah, there's power in the word. There is power, power, wonder work and power. There's some power in the word. Let me read Hebrews chapter four to you. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12 says this, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword. When you read that in the amplified version, listen to what it says. For the word that God speaks is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. Wow. The word that God speaks is alive and full of power. So what does Satan try to do? He knows he cannot, he knows he's no match for the word. So he tries to separate the believer from the word, because if he can separate you from the word, he can rob you of the manifestation of what you're standing for in the word. Listen to this. This is good. This is this is going to help you. One major way Satan tries to separate us from the word is by questioning the authenticity, the validity and the truthfulness of the word. I'll say that again. One major way Satan tries to separate us from the word is by questioning the authenticity the validity and the truthfulness of the word. Actually, it's his oldest trick. It is his oldest trick. He tries to cause you. He questions in order to make you question the authenticity, the validity and the truthfulness of the word. And in my, and I'm not saying that Satan's going to come before you and say, hey, do you believe that? Can you believe? It? No, no, no. He'll use people. Satan uses people to expose you to information that causes you to question the authenticity, the validity and the truthfulness of the word. Again, it is Satan's oldest trick. I'm going to prove it out to you. Turn to Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter three. Mm, mm, mm. Satan stirs up trouble to separate believers from the word of God. Mm. And one major way that Satan tries to separate us from the word is by questioning the authenticity, the validity and the truthfulness of the word. It is his oldest trick. It is his oldest trick. And unfortunately, he will often use people that you look up to. He will often use people that, you know, people that you love. Uh, people that you uh, hold in high esteem, people you hold in high regard, uh, celebrities, uh, public figures. He'll use anybody he can to say something that will cause the word of God to be diminished in your heart and in your mind. So it's important that no matter who it is, no matter what level of success a person experiences on this planet, you've got to know the word for yourself. And if it does not line up with what God has revealed to your heart, if it does not line up with the word of God, then you have to choose to rock with the word instead of the person. Because you got to understand that it's Satan behind the scenes trying to get you to question the authenticity, the validity 
and the truthfulness of the word. We see it in Genesis chapter three. Check it out. We're going to start at verse one. I'm going to read verses one through six. It says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So what is he doing? He's coming to Eve and he's questioning the authenticity, the validity and the truthfulness of God's word. But before he even does that, he's questioning to see if Eve really even knows the word for herself, because he said, see how subtle and crafty he is. He said, has God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, we know that God didn't say that. Let's look over here in chapter two. It says in chapter two, verse 15, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden, of every tree of the garden, of every tree of the garden, of every tree. God starts out by telling Wow. Thank you, Lord. God starts out by telling you what you can have, not what you can't have. See, to begin to tell you what you can't have is a negative connotation and God doesn't operate negatively. So God starts out by telling you what you can have, what you can do, what you do, do have a right to. Then God comes behind it with a caution to keep you from not experiencing what he just told you you got a right to. In verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So God didn't say that they couldn't eat of every tree. God said there's only one tree you can't eat of. But Satan showed up and talks to Eve about what God said. And he quotes God wrong. He says, Hath God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? God didn't say that. God said they could eat of every tree of the garden. He did not say, God did not say that they couldn't eat of every tree. So he's already tricking Eve before Eve even responds. Listen to this verse two. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Well, now Satan knows that he's got something on Eve because God never told Adam that you would die the day you touch it. God told Adam that you shall not eat of it because he said, if you eat of it, the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. God did not tell Adam the day, the day you touch it, you'll surely die. So now after Satan has come with questions to, to check the level of information according to God's word that Eve has, now he sees an opening. Now he sees how he can move in and deceive her. Wow, wow, wow. Verse three, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. So now he's outright calling God a lie. He is causing or trying to get Eve to question the validity, the truthfulness and the we got one more authenticity of God's word. He just outright said you won't surely die. In essence, he said, God is lying to you. That is not what's going to happen. God told you a big fat one. Well, what is he doing? He's getting Eve in a position to where she questions the authenticity, the validity and the truthfulness of the word that God spoke. Mm. And he's still doing it today. Verse four, and the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods knowing good and evil. They were already like God because God created man in his image and in his likeness. So they had an identity crisis because they were already like God. And instead of going back to God and saying, God, I heard some information that contradicted what you told us. What is this about? Then they instead of doing that, because God fellowshiped with them in the garden every day. So instead of waiting for God to show up and bringing this new information that they had received from an outside source or from a source that they had not previously received this kind of information from, they chose or Eve chose to take the serpent at his word instead of standing on the word that God had spoken. Mm. 
because he's trying to get you to question the authenticity, the validity and the truthfulness of the word. And he just wants you to abandon the word. That's that's good. Lord, Satan wants you to abandon the word that's regulating your life. Mm. Verse five, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. Verse six. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. What happened? Satan was successful in causing Eve and ultimately Adam to abandon the word that they heard because they questioned the authenticity, the validity, the validity and the truthfulness of the word that God spoke to them. The Bible says that Adam was right there with her. It says that Eve, it says that Eve gave to her husband and he did eat. He gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. That implies that Adam was at least close enough to realize what was going on. Mm. But Satan had moved in and caused some doubt to creep in. So why, why is that important? I also want to show you something in verse six. I'm going to get ready to bring this to a close in a moment, but I want to show you something. When the woman saw, look at verse six, Genesis three, verse six. When the woman saw that the tree was, check this out, good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Why is that important? Because Satan tempts you with what looks good. If it doesn't look good to you, if it's not appealing to you, it's not a temptation. So when she f changed her focus from what God told us to what this serpent is telling me, now she's realizing, well, you know what? This tree does look pretty good. It looks just like the other trees that we eat for food. It does look good to my eyes. Wow. It looks good to my eyes and it's a tree to be desired to make one wise. Now listen to this. The tree is good for food, pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Now that sounds real familiar to me. So I'm going to turn back to Mark chapter four, Mark four nineteen, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things. Wow. He dealt with what she wanted. And that's what Satan does. He deals with what you want. He sits back, he observes, and he watches to figure out what is it they want? What is it that they're pining for? What is it that's important to them? Because that's the, wow, that's the trap I'm going to set. When she saw that it was good for food, when she saw that it was pleasant to her eyes, and when she saw that it could make her wise, she took of the fruit and ate. So what is Satan doing now? What has Satan been doing? How has he been scoping you out? To come up with a divine or not a divine, but a, a, a distraction that's just attractive enough to deceive you. Yeah, it this this got to be God. This is exactly what I want. How can this be God and it feels good? How can this how can this be the enemy and it feels good? How can this not be God? This has to be something God wants for me to do because I love doing it. It feels good when I do it. Feels good when I go there. Feels good when I drive it. But it's hurting you. It's pulling you away from the things of God. Yeah, it feels good when you drive it, but because you're driving it now, you can't minister according to the scripture. You can't act in obedience to what God has instructed us concerning our giving in the word. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Satan will trick you with what you desire to do, what you desire to be and what you desire to have. That's why it's important that you stay with the word. You have to know the word for yourself and remove your. Oh, wow. Listen to this. You need to know the word for yourself and remove yourself from anyone or anything that questions or misrepresents the word. I'll say that again. It's important that you know the word for yourself and then remove yourself from anyone or anything or any group or any affiliation that questions or misrepresents the word. I will say that again. You have to know the word for yourself and then you have to remove yourself from anyone, anything, any group that questions or misrepresents the word. Let me show you something. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Wow. 
you know, in order to stick with the word, you have to make course corrections throughout your journey. You just can't stay on the same path. You're heading in the you're heading in the right direction, but the path will shift. And so it's important that you make course corrections. And sometimes those course corrections mean you have to alter. That's good. <laughs> I was about to say it differently. You have to alter the people you hang around and you have to alter the people you hang with because they are living in a type of way that is going to force you to compromise your beliefs so that they can be comfortable. And God didn't call you to compromise. God called you to stand out. He said, you're a city, you're a light that was, and you're set a light that's set on a hill. You know, you don't hide a light under a bushel basket. You put the light as high as it can go so it can give as much light to everybody in darkness. But look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse three, it says, but I fear lest that by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. See, Satan's trying to corrupt your mind and he you he does it subtly. Oftentimes you're not even aware of it. You might not even realize or recognize it. And so it's important that you take inventory of your thoughts. You take inventory of how you feel and you weigh all your thoughts according to the word of God. Those things that are pure, lovely, just, honorable, of good report, so on and so forth. Think on these things. You have to. You have to take inventory of what you're thinking and ask yourself, is this godly? Is this in line with the scripture? Should I be thinking this way? Should I be feeling this way? And if I shouldn't be thinking this way or feeling this way, I have to bring my mind and my emotions in agreement and in alignment with the word of God. And if I'm around someone that causes me to compromise the word for their comfort, then I've got to put some distance between me and that person person or me and that group of people because we don't want anybody beguiling us and removing us from the simplicity that is in Christ. Keep it simple, saints. You know, when I was in corporate America, there was an acronym, kids, keep it simple, stupid. I never liked the term stupid, so it applies for us. Keep it simple, saints. If it gets too difficult, it, it's not for you because the things of God are simple. The, the deeper you go in God, the more simple the revelation becomes make sure you ask yourself how you missed it in the first place. It talks about the simplicity, verse three, the simplicity that is in Christ. Being with God is not difficult. Being in God is not difficult. It just requires obedience and it requires commitment and it requires faith. So what do we need to do as we bring this to a close? We need to base and build our life on the word of God. That is the only sure foundation. If you want to go from start to finish, you have to continue in the word and you have to base and build your life on the word. How do you do that, Pastor Jay? Thank you, Lord. You do that by bringing your thoughts, your actions, your thoughts, your speech, your decisions and your actions in alignment and in agreement with the word of God. I think according to the word. I speak according to the word and I act according to the word. When I think according to the word, when I speak according to the word and when I act according to the word, I am in alignment with the word and I will bear the fruit of what the word promised me I would have. I have to start, continue and finish with the word of God. You have to start, continue and finish with the word of God. It is the bridge to carry you from beginning to end. You have to look at Jesus the whole time because he's the author and the finisher of our faith. You have to start with Jesus. You have to continue with Jesus and you got to finish with Jesus. Anything else like they used to say back in the day, anything else is uncivilized. I pray you got some out of this today. Remember, don't let Satan win. Don't let him deceive you. Don't let Satan force you to abandon the word. Meditate in the word day and night so you can make your way prosperous. And then you will have not just success. Then you will have good success. Amen. I pray this bless you. Go back and listen to this again. Watch part one, watch part two, watch part three. Get it all in your spirit because it's going to help you in the coming days, weeks, months and years as you live. If you if you apply the principles that we taught from this message, it'll equip you to overcome and it'll equip you to stand when you want to give up. Remember this. You are empowered by faith. You are equipped for service and your success is in God's word. I love you. 
Be blessed in Jesus' name.